So we have been going through Advent, and if you're kind of new to church and you don't know what that word means, Advent is a word for the month, kind of the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, where churches all over the world will prepare their hearts in, you know, for the coming of Jesus. And we think about kind of in three stages. We remember Jesus has come. We look forward to Jesus coming again. But we also, we take time to realize that Jesus is with us each day. And so that's kind of what Advent's about. And we go through, um, you know, four different kind of words that help us focus on the coming of Jesus. So we've done hope. Um, last week we did peace. And so today we're going to do joy and next week's love. Okay, so it's kind of the four words that we go through. So as you've been driving around, you've probably seen like Christmas advertisements and things like that. Has anybody seen these signs or other ones like it that just say joy? They don't say joy to the world. They don't say joy, you know, any sort of relation to Christmas or Jesus. They're just like joy. Like we're going to shove joy down your throat for no apparent reason. It's almost like they're yelling at you, be joyful. And I want to ask you, what is it about Christmas that makes you joyful? Is it the lines that you wait in for shopping. How many people, that's it for you. That does it for you, right? Is it the traffic? Have you noticed how there's more traffic everywhere? And also, I noticed yesterday, for whatever reason, I think to mess with us, they decided to do a bunch of construction in Delaware. Like, they were like, you know what? This is a good time of year to start tearing up some roads because then there's not many people on the road. I, was, I sat in traffic just on a back road in Hokesson for like 20 minutes yesterday. Um, there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way of our joy. Have you ever, like, let's be honest. All right, I'm going to tell you something about Mandy. Mandy gets a little stressed out in November, okay? She really likes Christmas. She starts shopping December 26th for the next Christmas, okay? Just so you know. That's where she'll be when we take church off. She'll be out shopping for next year. But she starts getting nervous in November. My, I probably should ask you beforehand. That she, that like, that that Christmas will be over soon. <laughs> like mid-November, she, that's the kind of person she is. I get excited. She's like, oh man, it's going to be over soon. I'm like, no, just enjoy it. And she, you know, do you ever get though on the other side of Christmas and wonder, did I enjoy that at all? Like you, especially, you know, if you're racing around, we always say we're going to get our shopping done a week early. And then we're, you know, I'm always shopping the night before Christmas. We're always wrapping presents till three in the morning. I hate that, by the way. Mandy makes me wrap all the little things we put in the stockings too, which infuriates me because I know it's special, but our kids are adults now, so get over it. So, um, I mean, it's so much work. They should wrap their own little things. That would be even better. So, um, but you can, it's so easy to get through the Christmas season and right, be like, my, was my life so full of all the other stuff that it crowded out the joy? Like how many of us are really kind of present with the joy of the things about Christmas that make it joyful. And so, you know, because we read in the story of Christmas from the Bible, we read that this is supposed to be about joy, right? The angel said to them, do not be afraid. All right, if you've been to church ever, you've probably heard this verse. I bring you, these are the angels talking about Jesus. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Because today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you and he is the Messiah, the Lord this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And so the whole idea of Christmas is that it's supposed to be great joy for all people, right? And yet we get so crowded out. Okay, so listen, this teaching is not going to be about how to have a great Christmas season because that's really boring. Let's take that and let's apply it to our whole life. Because as Christians, it's not just about one month out of the year or one day out of the year. We're, because of Jesus, we have the opportunity to live joy-filled lives all year round. And that's where I think it gets really challenging. Because when I think about life, there's so many things that get in the way of joy, right? There's so many like, it, it can be easy to let the daily grind keep us from daily joy, right? Just like get up in the morning, right? It's like when you wake up in the morning, how often are you like, thank you, Jesus, for this day? Maybe sometimes when it's Saturday, right? Maybe, right? But no, I'm just kidding. Maybe sometimes you're more mature than me, but often it's like, it's a little bit of a struggle. You're like, why is it dark outside? I wish there was at least some light. Why is it freezing when I take the dogs out in the morning? Right? It's easy to start your day kind of complaining. It's easy to start your day with the weight of the, the kind of the day or the week on your shoulders, 
And, and so much of our time can be like going from one task to the other and, and getting through like whether you're a student and you're like, man, I got to get to school at like three o'clock in the morning. They make high school students start so early. I don't know why, but you get there and like you just sit in classes and you're like, what is the point of this? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Or you can be a young adult who's like either coming out of college, going through college or getting a job. And then, you know, especially if you've come out of college, and you've gotten a job and you're working full time for the first time in your life. And you're like, is this all there is to life? You know, it's like not, maybe not as much joy as you thought there was going to be, or you're later in life and you're like, this is all there is to life, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, oh, how do I, you know, some of us, right, it's, it's like we trying to get through most of life to get to the moments of joy. And I just want to know, like, I don't think that's how it's supposed to be. Like, have you ever, you know, those things like, thank God it's Friday, what's that, TGIF, or like, living for the weekend, right? Like, man, that's just a sad way to live. Like you're trying to get through five of the days so that you can finally enjoy, or like get through most of the year so you can enjoy vacation or like, I think a lot of us want to live on the mountaintop of life. You know, like those, the peak experiences. But the reality is most of life isn't on the mountain or in the valley. Most of life is right here in the middle. And you know, it's just, like, if you and I don't know how to be joyful paying bills and joyful driving our kids to soccer and joyful cleaning the dishes, like, you know, just like the day in, day out, then our joy is going to be limited, right? We're going we're gonna to limit our joy to 2% of our life. And I think Jesus wants more for you and more for me. You know, so how do we do that? Like, is there more to life joy-wise? Like, can we be filled with joy. And there's a verse that I want to look at today. So last week, we looked at like three chapters, if you remember, if you were here. We did John 14, 15, and 16. This week, we're going to look at one verse, okay? And that's what I love about the Bible. You can read the Bible, large swaths of the Bible, and get meta messages out of it that can change your life. Or you can read individual verses and words and get messages out of it for your life. It's such a deep and rich resource. So let's, let's read this. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. And listen, if you're not familiar with the Bible, that's totally fine. If you've never been to church before, we're so glad that you're here. In fact, we started this church seven years ago to help people like you reconnect with God, okay? So we're glad that you're here. And this is a passage written by a guy named Paul. And Paul at this time was in jail. He had been imprisoned because of preaching that Jesus had died and rose again and that Jesus was God and that you only found salvation for your sins and salvation for eternity in Jesus, believing in Jesus. And so he's in prison. He's in a Roman prison, which you may or may not know this, but they weren't nice, okay? They weren't nice. They didn't even like feed you. You had to have people bring you food. That's why in a lot of Paul's letters, he'll say, thank you so much for your provision because people have been bringing him food in prison so that he could eat. Because he's like, he can't cook. He's just in prison. So he's sitting in this Roman prison. He knows like his time is limited. He knows for every day that he's in prison, there's people out there working against the message that he's been preaching, right? So there's these factions that don't agree and they're trying to like mess up the churches he's planted. And he's, so think of all the things he could be upset about. Maybe a few more things than some of us have. He doesn't have a lot of food. He's lonely, He's feeling like maybe he's a failure, like he's not out there doing what God's called him to do. And he's right. You know what I have to say to you guys? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again because most people are like, what? That's why he wrote the next part. Okay, he knew when you read that, you'd be like, always? I will say it again. Rejoice. And so we want to just look at this verse today because there's so much depth here. So the first word, does anybody read Max Licato? Any Max Licato fans? Like, oh, oh yeah. What I love, Max Licato is the king of taking a small verse and going word by word. And like, you're, by the end, you're like, I never knew there was so much meaning. I'm going to Max Licato the heck out of this verse today, okay? Here, let's go. So rejoice. We're starting with this word. Wait till we get to in. That word is powerful, okay? Um, so rejoice in the Lord always. So that is a present imperative word in the original language, which means it's an ongoing command. It is all the time all the time, all the time, it is always saying, it's like, be rejoicing. Not just rejoice once. Be rejoicing when you're driving the kids to school in the morning and they're complaining. Be rejoicing when you have to wake up at 6 a.m. and 
you forgot to do homework and then you're trying to get it done before you get on the bus. Be rejoicing even when you're sick, right? Be rejoicing when you have to fill out that spreadsheet again because the, your coworker messed it up and you're like, Amen? Can I get an amen? There we go. I knew I would get somebody. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reach all the people. Let me see. Be rejoicing when that parent sends you an angry email about, you know, you didn't play that kid enough minutes. And I got that? Yeah, right there. I got, I got a coach in the back. Okay, good. Two coaches sitting next to each other, actually. All right, but we, can all, we all get those things. What if we, like, woke up in the morning and we're like, today is a day that God has gifted me with? All of the things that will happen, God has stuff for me in it. I could, I could rejoice today. Like if you woke up one morning and God was like, oh man, I forgot about today. You're on your own, right? Then maybe you wouldn't have to rejoice, but like that's never gonna happen, right? The Bible tells us God neither slumbers nor sleeps, right? He's, he is, he's on, right? 24 seven, be rejoicing always. I skipped in and the, and we'll go back to Lord. Don't worry, always. And people are like, always? And I think Paul's like, always, always rejoicing, all the time. There is always a reason. Look at some of the times that the earliest followers of Jesus rejoiced. Here's one. The apostles left the Sanhedrin. So a little bit of context, a couple of the earliest leaders of the church, followers of Jesus who had lived with Jesus, learned from him, and then he died and rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and he left them to start the church And they would go out and preach and then they would get arrested and they would get beaten. And the beatings they would take were these, you know, these 40 minus one, right? So mercy was not to do 40 lashes, they'd do 39, but there were these cords of at least leather, if not stuff put in the leather like spikes and they would just whip you over your back, right? They, these, they left after being persecuted, after being put on trial, The apostles left rejoicing. Can you imagine? Because they had been counted, why were they rejoicing? Here's the key. Because they had been counted worthy of suffering. Have you ever been like, I am so happy that I've been counted worthy of suffering. I've always wanted to be counted worthy of suffering. (laughs) I've always kind of hoped God would look at me and be like, you are worthy of some suffering. I don't think we view it that way. They're like getting out of jail, getting out of being beaten, and they're like, let's go. You know, they're like whatever the, you know, old fashioned high five was. I don't know what they did, but like, they're like high five in, you know, they're like, maybe they do like the elbow thing, like baseball players. Why do only baseball players do that? I don't get it. Right. But they they do their like, you know, chest bump. They're like, we suffered. Yeah. Like, can you imagine? I mean, it's like as a coach, when I make my players run, like, you know, sprints, like line sprints. And at the end, they're never like, yes. Oh, it was great. Make us suffer some more, coach. You know? At another point, Paul tells us, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. It's kind of a theme here. Be careful. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. So as a follower of Jesus, even in the hardest times, we find ways to rejoice because we know God is working under the surface. Consider it pure joy. This is written by James, who was the brother of Jesus. And he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you get windfalls of lots of money that you weren't expecting, right? No, whenever you face trial, that's such a, that's such a cheesy pastor trick. Don't you hate when pastors do that? I know. I can't even take myself seriously when I do it. I mean, I, I did it on purpose, I, but it, clearly it didn't work. And I just have to call myself out for it. All right. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, there is a way to rejoice in every situation. If they can rejoice when they're imprisoned, if they can rejoice when they're beaten, if they can rejoice when they're suffering, we can rejoice when someone messes up our spreadsheet. You feel the conviction? I can. Yeah, you're weeping in conviction over there. And here's why. Because we don't rejoice in our circumstances. We don't rejoice in things going our way. We don't rejoice in our coworkers being competent. (laughs) We rejoice in the Lord. I know it's so simple. Some of the best verses that can change your life and change your perspective are the simplest ones. And sometimes we can like, we're like, oh, I gotta find the next deep spiritual truth. And you know what? 
You can waste a lot of time doing that instead of just like living in the simple truths of the scripture. This is a simple truth that you and I can choose to live in every day. And can I just tell you, if you're not a believer, if you don't know Jesus, right, at the end of the service, we're gonna give you a chance to respond to that. But this is, this is what, the, what we call the gospel, the message of Jesus, the story that Jesus told was that life without Jesus is hard. Life without Jesus has a lack of purpose, a lack of meaning, it's, and, and it can be lonely, and it can be, how do I deal with the weight of sin on my shoulders, right? How do I deal with the this pressures of life and the separation I feel with God? And so Jesus entered into the world and said, I want to reconnect you with a God who loves you. I want to build this relationship back again. And that's why we can rejoice in the Lord. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, or you've never made that decision, or you've been to church a bunch of times, but you're like, I don't know if this is for me, this is the point. Like, this is what's behind, you know, you see all these people who are, like, believing in Jesus. The point is that we've found joy and meaning and purpose in life because Jesus has set us free. Jesus has given us purpose. Jesus has made us know love. Jesus has given us an identity in him. And so we can say we rejoice not in church and not in, you know, being good people or not in having moral certainty. We can rejoice in the Lord, in Jesus, who he is. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will get, I will say that again. I would say that again, wouldn't you? That's like a great time for you to be like, amen. There you go. You got it. Yeah. We'll work on it, guys. We'll work on it. Okay. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. You know why you can rejoice in the Lord always? Because God's always doing stuff. So I started thinking about, what are some things God's always doing? Oh, so one of the, dangers of memorizing your teaching is every once in a while you're not perfect. And I just wasn't perfect there. I'll just let you in a little secret. So that little lead-in I just did, that's coming, but this is really good. Listen, this is so cool. This guy wrote this about Paul. He said, Paul's sitting there in prison. He's like, you can lock me in, but you can't lock God out because you rejoice in the Lord. Isn't that a good one? Uh, that, I think that's amen worthy too, right? I didn't write it. So you can lock me in, and right? You can apply this to your life. I would memorize this one. When you're having a bad day, when, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling insecure, when you're feeling overwhelmed by the amount of homework that you have to get done, you can be like, well, you can lock me in, but you can't lock God out because he's going to get in. He's going to break in. He's going to break into this prison. He's going to break into this hard time, and he's going to bring me joy. Um, a famous pastor, Charles Spurgeon, he's a pastor, a theologian from the 1800s, wrote this. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you cannot rejoice in anything else, but you can rejoice in the Lord. Then rejoice in him to the full. Do not rejoice in your temporal prosperity for riches take to themselves wings and fly away. Do not rejoice even in your great successes in, your, in the work of God. If the Lord be your joy, your joy will never dry up. That is so true, isn't it? If the Lord be your joy, your joy will never dry up. All other things are but for a season, but God is forever and ever. Make him your joy, the whole of your joy, and then let this joy absorb your every thought. Be baptized into this joy. Plunge into the deeps of his unutterable bliss of God, of joy in God. Beautiful, isn't it? I love that. So our joy is in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And so I was thinking about all the things that God's always doing. There it is. You see it? There it is. That's where we're going. Here it is. God is always with you. How can you rejoice in the Lord always? Because the Lord is always with you. If you want to take a picture of this and read up these verses later, all these verses are, are, are you know, you can trust me, they're in the Bible. God is always loving you. Think about this. Wherever you go in your day, when you're stuck in traffic and you're late for an appointment, that's one of the most stressful parts of my life. I feel like out of control because I can't make people do things faster and also kind of a failure because I know I'm gonna be late to this appointment. And it's like two of my, I hate not being in control and I hate being a failure. And all of those things happening at the same time. But God's with me in that moment. God's with me. He's always with me. Guys, even in the darkest times, like that's why Christians can face intense suffering because we're never alone. And that's not just like a cliche thing that we get to say as Christians. It's not something you just like put on a mug and you drink out of it in the morning of your coffee. Like this is actually why we rejoice in the Lord because no matter what, God is with you. He promises in that verse right there, Hebrews 13 and five, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never leave you. You will never be alone. 
God is always loving you. His love never fails. His love never fails. It never stops. It never ends. It always endures. It always perseveres. God is always advocating for you. God is, the Bible tells us that Jesus is in heaven right now advocating on your behalf. He's always on your side. God is always good. I can rejoice in the Lord always because he's always good, because he's always working. Jesus said, up until this day, my father has been working and I too am working. The father and Jesus are doing work in your life right now. Do you believe that? Listen to me, even if you don't right now believe in Jesus, if you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus, God is already working in your life. And you will one day look back across your life and see the fingerprints of God on your past as he led you into your future because God is always working in your life. God's always in charge. Isn't that good to know? You wake up in the morning, you can say, I rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, I rejoice because you're in charge of my day. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to have all the strength. I don't have to have all the answers. God is with me and he's in charge. God, his ways are always higher than my ways. I can trust that he knows what he's doing better than I do. Amen. <laughs> I think a few men needed to hear that this morning. Just Tim, that was for you. Okay. Um, God is always, he is always, now listen, I had to use some double, double negatives for this to work, but God is always not failing. Right? I mean, the Bible says he never fails, but you, I needed to put always in there. So God is always not failing. God is always not changing. He never changes. I wake up in a bad mood sometimes, but God never does. Can you imagine waking up like literally, if you, if you walked out and Jesus was in your living room every morning, he'd just be like not stressed out. He'd be so peaceful. He'd be so happy to see you. Like, do you know that? Can you picture Jesus being happy to see you? no matter what you had done so far or hadn't done, he's just happy to see you. He definitely had made coffee for you, right? And he's just like, look at this beautiful sunset outside that I just created, you know? No, he'd be just hanging out, right? You know, even if it was raining. Okay, so rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. So I wanna just tell you, like, one of my things about the Bible is it's not just good to understand it, right? It's not just true, it's helpful. It's not just good to understand it, it's, it's necessary to apply it. Because you can get all the knowledge up here, but if it doesn't change you here and here, like in your actual life, that's this, um, then it's, what's it worth? So I want to tell you a little bit about my, my week, and then we're going to wrap up and sing two more songs. So I had a particularly bad week this week. Um, I, I don't like messing up. I don't like making mistakes. I don't like failing. I'm a, I'm a perfectionist and I'm a, you know, high achiever type personality, whatever those are on all the, on all the tests you take. That's how I end up all the time. I made so many mistakes this week. So, um, you know, I'm full-time here. This is my job. This is my passion, but I also, we're a vineyard church. And so I work for the vineyard movement too. I, I'm the national youth director as a side job. I made two pretty bad mistakes in that job this week. So the first one was I misallocated some money I know. And I had to write them and say that I overspent on my annual budget and um, buy, buy some money. And that I, you know, and we worked it out, but like, I don't like saying that kind of stuff, you know, especially about money. Um, then I'm, I'm, I'm on the team that runs our national leadership conference, uh, runs the youth conference portion. So we have a Denver national conference and an Ohio national conference. You need to know this for the, to see how bad I messed up. And so I'm getting a person in charge of those to work under me. And so I got them. And so this week I've got them on a zoom call. And I was like, Oh, this is so cool. Let's, we prayed together. I was like, I'm really excited. Let me tell you about each venue. And so as, and as we're talking, I realized they're, they're kind of looking at me weird. And I, I told them both they were running the Denver site. And worse, they canceled, one of them canceled a conference that they usually run every year to be there to run this thing for me. And I don't know if I can pay them both to go to that because now I have to hire someone else to go to Ohio and neither of them can do Ohio. And I was just like on this call, like, yeah, I messed up. Like, there's no, there's no, like, way around that. Like, yeah, I just, like, I royally messed this up, and, and I want to be a person who keeps my word. I've promised you both jobs. Then I went, the next day, we had our soccer banquet. I also coached a soccer team at the high school, and, you know, season's over. We had our soccer banquet. 
my least favorite thing to do is hurt people's feelings. And I, I messed up in some of my announcements of like individual players and I hurt someone's feelings really bad. Like really hurt their feelings. And their mom, I got a text from their mom. <sighs> That's how I felt. That's how I felt. You know, because if, you, if you're not careful, you can go to the, but I try so hard and people should have grace for me, right? It's like the self, that's what I do as a defense mechanism is that self-pity. But you know what the maturity is, own it. I messed up. So I'm writing. So then I, I'm not, I'm not done, unfortunately. <laughs> I woke up the next morning. I kid you not, I woke up the next morning. I was like, ah, oh. because that's how, you know, I woke up and I remembered I hurt that girl's feelings really bad. And then it hit me. I forgot another thing at the banquet. So five of our players got all conference honors. Big deal. I didn't talk about it. I totally forgot. And I couldn't go back to sleep. So I waited till it was early enough. And then I, I, I sat the morning, I sat in my little chair where I read my Bible and drink my coffee and pray every morning. And I sent like 10 apology texts in a row. Like, I'm sorry that I was, you know, you deserve better. I'm sorry. Like it must've made you feel, I'm sorry. And then I was like, great, now I got to read my Bible, right? So I read my Bible and start praying. I'm like, God, what's going on? And he was like, you're a failure. That's what he said, you know? And I said, okay, I hear you. I really can't argue with that one, you know? So, um, you know, I, we believe that God speaks to us today, not in a weird way, like he talks to us out loud and like, you know, hello, Christian, or, you know, not in a way that is supersedes scripture, but he, he speaks to us. He speaks to our hearts and our minds. And, and I felt very distinctly the Lord said, Humility is never wasted. I thought, oh, oh, like the, you know, who did that? Tim the Toolman Taylor. Oh, so sorry, I really aged myself. Everyone 50 and older appreciated that joke. No one else knows. All right, so I wrote it in my journal. Humility will never go to waste. Humility will never go to waste. And so even though I don't want to keep messing up and making mistakes, I don't want to hurt anybody else's feelings. But the thing is, I can rejoice in the Lord. I can I not rejoice because I like hurting people, re, not rejoice because I like letting people down, not rejoice because I like looking foolish in front of people on a Zoom call like, uh, right? That's literally how it went. I can rejoice in the Lord though, because in the Lord, he's like, well, I can work with this. I've been working with worse for years. You know, so what I can do is I can make you a better person by teaching you. You know what humility does? Humility teaches you to depend on Jesus more. Humility breaks that false illusion that you don't make mistakes, right? Humility is like, I will let people down and they might never get over it and I'm still okay in Jesus. Because here's the thing that I really struggle with is if I can't, like, I'm okay, I hurt your feelings. Let's work it out. If we can get back to working it out, then I feel better about myself. You understand? Like, you, you're there too. Have you ever had it where you can't work it out? You do everything you can, balls in their court, but there's no reciprocation. Uh, and I am learning, like, I got to, like, be okay. I'm a, Jesus still loves me. That doesn't mean I'm a terrible person, right? But that's so hard. But I can rejoice because God's working. He, so he took all my mistakes and he did deep work in my heart that's going to pay off way more than me being perfect. I can rejoice in the Lord because maybe some of the people that I got to interact with needed to see a Christian and or pastor actually apologize. Maybe some of the people that I interacted with have never seen a Christian apologize in their life. And so they're like, I've never heard of a Christian apologizing. Christians are always just telling me what I'm doing wrong, right? I can rejoice in the Lord because I don't know everything and he's in charge. He might have done something deep in their hearts through that apology. You never know. There's power in forgiveness. I can rejoice in the Lord because he's always working. And so that's just one example from my life. Can you take that and apply it to your life? If God is always with me and God is always working and God is always helping me, then we can rejoice in the Lord no matter what. Worship team, you guys can come on up. So do you want this in your life? I do. Let me give you three scenarios that you might be in. One, maybe you've never known Jesus like this. And what I wanna do is I wanna invite you today to consider giving your life to Jesus. And when we say giving your life to Jesus, what that means is in, in the Bible, Jesus said to people, believe in me, follow me. And it's a choice that you would make to believe Jesus is God who died for my sins and rose from the dead. I want to 
follow him for the rest of my life. If that's where you are today, what I would like you to do is we're going to go into worship. It's going to give you an opportunity to, to pray that with Jesus. You can just talk to God and tell him that. But on the back of your card before you hand it, I want you to mark at the top by either committing my life to Jesus or if you've done it before, but you've been gone for a long time from Jesus, I'm recommitting. Mark one of those and I will email you tomorrow and I'll give you some resources to start the journey because it's not a magical like prayer, like pray that and like, woo, never have to think about God again. It's actually like crossing the starting line of a lifetime journey, okay? Um, maybe you are barely keeping your head above water right now, if we're honest. You're going through life and, and it's just been too much. And I think Jesus wants to meet you in that right now. He wants to show you that there is joy in him, even in this struggle right now. And what I would encourage you to do is, is allow other people into your struggle, that's why we have other Christians in our lives. So we're going to offer prayer over here to the side once we do these next two songs. You can go get prayer from someone. Um, you can come, you know, share your heart with me. You can email me. You can email your small group leader if you have one. But don't just sit in the struggle by yourself. Rejoice in the Lord by bringing other people into it. You don't have to go alone. And like the, the other group that I felt like God put on my heart was maybe you're just coasting through life right now and it's, you're not connecting on a deep level with God. You're just kind of coasting. If that is you, I think this is God knocking on the door of your heart. And he's saying, I have more for you. Can you hear that? Not I want more from you. I have more for you. And I think that he would be saying that there's more joy in your life if you would just do the in the Lord part a little bit more. Okay? 